it was actually a two-year process to get to this point. So uh, there were so many people that were involved. First off, thank you to Wendy and Ethan for hosting today and also to Giles and L.A. Fogg for uh, playing. Um, there'll be uh, some music after our conversation. And thank you to Jonathan Megan, I'm not sure if he's here today, for helping uh, spark this collaboration with Anna. And um, to Tanya Rubeck for collaborating with Mark on the, the wonderful design. And above all, we really have to thank the many contributors to the publication, which is as much about the material dimensions of Anna's work as the social dimensions. So uh, in alphabetical order, Math Bass, Julia Bryan Wilson, Trini Dalton, Jennifer Doyle, E. Fowler, Rita Gonzalez, Alice Konitz, Jenny Sorkin, and A.L. Steiner. So some of them are with us today. And then, of course, uh, Anna, to being such a fabulous collaborator. Uh, I, it was such uh, an amazing process for us all to work together on the publication. Uh, so with that, I'd like to pass it over to, uh, what? to Mark and Tanya to start to bring us into the material dimensions of the book. Hi, everybody. Thanks again for coming. I also wanted to mention uh, RAM Publications, who are co <clears throat> sort of co-sponsoring this event and who are our wonderful uh, LA-based distributor, who are making sure that this book goes out into the world and has a sort of presence beyond LA and, and beyond um, our immediate community here. Um, Tanya and I just wanted to talk very briefly to sort of bring you into the, to the book that we're celebrating a little bit, just show you a little bit about the book, about how we went through... Um, putting it together, and, um, and then we would have a, a few sort of informal readings. Um, so that's the, the cover is what you're seeing here, and I just want to casually sort of walk you through uh, the book. So um, the book starts with these uh, opening spreads where we, we just sort of incorporated process, uh, illustrations, and bring you kind of into uh, uh, Anna's world before any text, before any installation in images. Um, and this was just really important to us uh, as a way of um, framing the work um, outside of a kind of institutional framework. So this book is not sponsored by a museum, not really sponsored by a gallery. Um, and so it was just very important for us that it be framed through process and through a kind of immediate engagement with um, the, the wide variety of, of, of work that Anna does. That includes, of course, sculpture, fashion, uh, kind of interventions, uh, uh, as well as domestic objects, functional objects, so to try to give a sense of that larger sphere. The other thing, and to think, I think for book design, and I'll let Tanya pick up on this, it's really nice to think macro and micro. Uh, and so we fixated pretty early on on the manicule, which is this typographic device, which is a pointing finger. People will know this from antique text, sort of out of fashion, but it became a kind of an important device for us uh, in the book as a way to kind of remind you about the body and the, and the, and the, and the kind of material quality the, that you're holding something in your hand. So uh, I think it's kind of nice to think about this macro zoomed out version of looking at an artist process and then to think about as designers these very mac micro kind of moves. So the manicule became a kind of important uh, literal uh, device to hang uh, design design on, to hang things on. So um, just very quickly, things that were in Alex's sort of in our minds when we were thinking about framing this project, Sophie Tauber Arp, um, Emma Kuhn's uh, Kleenex, the post-punk band. Um, and just to kind of elaborate on that, the, these kind of objects or gestures that are at kind of interstitial positions that are somewhat in, indeterminate that maybe are between the domestic and the public, that are between the kind of the social and the private. And so we were thinking a lot about that in relation to, to Anna's work in terms of historical precedents or complications that could unfold in the design. Yeah. Um, the pet rock also became a kind of an important uh, figure in the back of our mind as we were thinking about these, uh, the way objects can inhabit your domestic space and become a kind of part of your world and something that you converse with. and. Um, so I want to turn it over to Tanya just to talk a little bit more about the material dimensions of the design, just as I think it became, it's, it's something you, re I mean, we all sort of love art books, obviously, and engage with them, but it's not always very clear why decisions are made or how things take the form that they take. So maybe I thought it, it might be interesting to just very quickly go through the book and to talk a little bit about the decisions we made and how we arrived at them. So. Yeah, so, so one of the 
one of the one of the first things I mean you might notice about some what appears a lot in Anna's work is this idea of hanging um, sort of things hanging off sculptures or the way the sculpture is hung on the wall. So the basic kind of typographic idea became this uh, hanging, working with the page numbers and kind of the general like conventions of running headers or the captions as well. Uh, so everything kind of has this, the page numbers and the running heads became almost like little pins for the images. And so there's always these little tiny overlaps that happen on the top edge of the pages. Um, and then again, the manacle and also kind of this second layer of text that began, uh, sort of appeared almost a little bit later on in the process where we thought it was really interesting of the, the way Anna would talk about some of the projects. So we sort of added this other layer of text that almost became another layer that would hang on top of the images. And those were all in Anna's voice uh, talking about the projects. Um, again, sort of, so you see this sort of when you start thinking about this idea of hanging and you're looking at um, the captions and uh, the typography and then you sort of, you see it in the images as well you if you become conscious of it. Um, and then here, um, this, uh, so maybe do you want to talk about a little bit the, about the, pro, uh, the documents, the actual documents appearing in well, the, the publication. Well, the book is, is collaboration, performance. performance. So, so we had this idea of uh, there would be these, so there are documents that sort of appear as actual documents in a publication kind of layered um, in, the, in the more performative way in this middle section. And so here you have the performance and then you have the score of the performance, the actual document that Anna just gave us and we just scanned and then there was writing on it and so it, became, it becomes a second layer behind the, the images of what happened in the space. Um, so more, more uh, and then I guess the, the other idea was sort of just um, including images interspersed in the text. Um, it, um, yeah, what was, I can't remember what well, we were I mean, talking about because here. We, because there's such a variety of texts, there's mm -hmm. poetic writing, conversational writing, sort of, and so finding a way to get, always remind you that the, the objects are sort of present. Always going back to the object. Yeah. Um, also combining sort of like domestic, domestic scale with more plate-like imagery. Um, this is our favorite spot in the book. <laughs> we're, we're, you, these are all things you discover, right? I mean, you arrive with like a million images that you have to like go through and organize, and so these surprises happen as you go, as you go through and work with the material. Yeah. And I think for us, when we started the process, I think um, there's this question of like, what is an artist monograph, and how to rethink what an artist, artist monograph might be, and how the artist's voice could run through, which is, I think, where you were talking about the manacle of the artist kind of popping up and pointing in. Uh, but then also, we wanted there to be different textures and tones uh, of, of writing that would both be a consideration, perhaps, of, of Anna's work, reading Anna's work, but then reading Anna's work through her social, social um, her community, uh, the people that she's in dialogue with already through her work. Um, so really trying to rethink how we could structure a monograph where it would be less about a kind of an analytical reading of the work as, as and more of an opening up and pointing outwards to the different kind of social collaborative dimensions and the multivalence of, of her practice. And then, I don't know what else we got design-wise. We're almost to the end of the book, actually. This is the second half. One other nice thing that we had in a kind of problem, you know, these artist books, you know, a lot of people in this room will know this, you're always constrained by budget, page count, what you, can you do with the space you've got and the money you've got to spend. And, you know, there was so much great stuff to deal with here. You know, we had these amazing images of detail, uh, of incredible detail in the sculptures and in the, wor in the work. But then, of course, you want to see the whole work, too. So we came up with these very sort of cr crude but really effective techniques of just smacking images right on top of a detail, and then you get to see them both simultaneously. Um, and then the, the last section, which is which is we, we thought was very important to, to include and is a kind of convention of the monograph, is the interview. And so the book ends with an interview uh, between Rita and Anna. Um, the exterior parts of the book are blue, and the interior, the very middle of, of the book, is is in rust. So it really has this formal shape that's very similar to one of Anna's Anna's works that's like covered in denim or has a 
and has a ceramic core. So really these formal devices in the design are really being informed by the work itself. And so the, uh, the interview that ends it uh, includes obviously images of the work, but then also finding resonances and, and rhymes and sort of nice juxtaposition. So we had all of these things that l lined up as kind of, you know, profiles that went right across the page. So again, finding these kind of uh, formal and um, juxtapositions that can allow to kind of speak to the content, but also sort of give you a visual snapshot of kind of resonances. Um, and that's our back cover. Yeah. <laughs> so it might seem kind of strange that we're starting with the, question, the kind of conversation about the design and the materiality, but one of the a really core thing for us in our conversations with Anna was about the hand and the, the way that your um, your practice is so much about a kind of a, a, a material consideration. Um, and so I'm just going to read a very short quote from Annie Albers that was a guiding principle for us as we were going through the process of the book. She says, for we are overgrown with information, decorative maybe, but useless in any constructive sense. We have developed our receptivity and have neglected our own formative impulse. It is no, active, uh, no accident that nervous breakdowns occur more often in our civilization than in those where creative power had a natural outlet in daily activities. And this fact leads to a suggestion. We must come down to earth from the clouds where we live in vagueness and experience the most real thing there is, material. And that's the way the book opens up. Um, and so instead of kind of having a a, a staid conversation that dissects every aspect of the book, we thought it would be really nice uh, to evoke and invoke many of the texts at hand and um, the, the different uh, poetic reactions to, to Anna's practice. So uh, with that in mind, um, we're going to turn it over to Trini Dalton uh, to open up the, uh, the readings. Thank you. Yay. Oh, this tiny mic stand. Thanks. It's a, big, um, it's a big honor and privilege to be a part of this project. I really love this book so much. Um, it's so unique and really gorgeous and um, makes me really excited to see Anna's work collected in such a, such a, um, I don't know, I just really love the materiality, as you were saying, of this book. It's a unique project. Thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm just reading one short poem that's in the front, uh, front matter of the book, right across from the table of contents. It's called Des Denim Cat. There is an African cat on the endangered list whose coat is denim. They are highly prized and poachers are notorious for catnapping them from their native habitat, the veldt. These denim cats live in the last stands of wild African violet. They have yellow stitched seams and copper rivets, which is where Levi Strauss got the idea. I was unaware that all the denim Americans wear has driven the denim cat nearly to extinction. Naively assuming denim was woven from cotton and dyed indigo in large vats, I now have devoted myself to protecting the denim cats. Each pair of denim boots we wear, each book bag, each jacket. Our genes are cats that once frolicked on a distant savanna. On the subway, a man approached me with an exotic bejeweled cat carrier. This cage looked like an Ethiopian amulet or foil in Sikhi language. There were day trees here, jammed into the air holes, and it concerned me that the beasts contained therein might suffocate from the succulent stuffing. But no, the poacher said, denim cats eat jade leaves, and had I seen a denim up with no place to go. Did I want him? The man asked for a thousand US dollars. We set up a payment plan, my stop came and I carried the cat home. There is no information on the internet about these cats. It's not as if that man offered me a how-to pamphlet. At the pet store I was tempted to purchase a denim bed for my cat to ease his culture shock, denim on denim, but thought better of it. His bed is tan corduroy. I feed him jade and canned meat, advertising itself as prairie formula. This cat is not like the velveteen rabbit and never turns into a plush toy. He is feral, bitter, and attacks unless appeased with gifts. 
When I wash him with water, he's prone to shrink. Please, before you wear denim, think. Protect the denim cat. If you meet a thirsty one, offer him a drink. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks, Steiner. <laughs> this was great to go over. You're using the table of contents. I know. It works really well. It's this thing. You look at it, and then it directs you. It's just okay. so analog and so awesome. Um, so yeah, I decided when Anna asked me, well, I didn't know what to do, of course. And then I thought I would go through my archive and start by looking for photos of us or of Anna or something regarding Anna. And of course, then that became obsessive and obsessive compulsive-ish because I didn't, there were so many places to look and how do you trace you know, through an archive and it's always happening. But this is really, really specific. So it was kind of an incredible process and I'm just so glad that you know, it came out of, of you asking me this. Um, I could have made it easier and just written some, something, but I needed the photos. So with the essay, our, um, some of the photos, some didn't make it in. There were various reasons why some didn't make it in. Some were too revealing, um, you know, and some were irrelevant in some way, but um, I'm just gonna read the first uh, paragraph or so and then, um, and then move to a different text just to enhance it. So my essay um, is called Feelings and How to Destroy Them. And it led eventually to actually a show I dismounted with the, with the same name. So, you know, generative. It was a generative project. So thank you on many levels. Um, Dreamcatcher at Fritz Hicks, Sundown Salon, number 19, Baroque Geo, 2005, was my first encounter with Anna Tumoy's work. I don't know what we talked about that day, but I remember staring into an oversized, heavy ceramic globular cluster in feathered circle. I wondered why I didn't know this person better. Women by Women Who Love Women, 2005, was my second encounter. It was an extension of a collaborative photo project with Eve Fowler. More than a blind date, it was a libid libidinally artistic Ponzi scheme, sharing influential women in our lives as photo subjects. Anna and I hit it off really well at our first session in her apartment cave in the Lower East Side. She agreed that the axe that I brought was an appropriate prop. It really could have gone either way. Um, and please buy the book so you can see <laughs> all of the prurient images and um, descriptions of, of our many, many years of knowing each other. And, and now, that, now I'm living here, which is probably partially her fault. Um, so, so <laughs> it's okay, I'm, I'm working into it, working into it. I'm just gonna quickly read from um, a zine I found called Rocky Ledge, number six. Um, when I opened it, it's some, I found this somewhere in California, I can't remember exactly where, and there were a couple of poems by Eileen Miles typed out thing. And, um, and so I want to read one that was in this rocky ledge um, called Barbara's Hunt. And it was written March 13, 1979, on the cusp of the 80s. Um, you make me feel like I'm in California. That's what it is. Everything's bright and leaves are flopping in the breeze. My ideal California. That's how I feel right now. Everything wide open, life writing itself. I love our sunglasses. I love your food stamps. I think you've got a European ass. No, a Norman ass. Mine's Anglo-Saxon, no Anglo-Irish. Oscar Wilde, Yeats, you know. Inside of this is petals and petals going on forever. It's so pretty and it's alive. I just had a natural cookie. Asked, asked for sesame, but it seemed rather coconut. Your cunt is a natural cookie, Barbara. Told you I was going to do that. Naturally, Eileen. Eileen, naturally. I don't smoke, like I lost a major part of my punctuation, my days, and I'm just randomly writing or, or something, sans beat or something. Repetition seems so oppressive. Instead of here, new with you, here in California. Big bright room in March. Moreover, get a bigger place. It's, a bigger, it's, it's bigger, honey. So what? So what if we just walk around in the sun every day getting blasted on coffee, the beans? So what? We wake up with two nearly full dead beers by the bed. Morning gets louder and louder, and the dogs are roosters, and the birds a radio. The radio is symbolism. These guys are always talking about how sunny it is. The weather since these guys are inside this funny room, cooped up. 
I'd never believe those guys if they say it's raining, snowing, very, very sunny. Those guys are in a prison, so why should we believe them? We just can't look out the window or feel some breeze on our backs, or legs, hands, and arms. I don't want to get out. Oh, yes, but I always do. Our legs going down the street. The pavement grows broader and broader. The sky's getting wider and wider. And I swear we are the only words. I think I'll, I think I'll leave that. Yeah, so thanks again. Another quick note on the writing is that one of the things when we first approached um, with Anna, a lot of the writers, we mentioned this idea of manifestos and what would it be like to have a book full of manifestos. And that was, even though not all the writing is a quote unquote manifesto, we had that, we had that energy I think in there in terms of also some of the pacing and some of the kind of provocations of what people were going to be talking about um, in the publication. So um, with that in mind, um, Where's Jenny's image? Oh, uh, we can I'll find it there. So unfortunately, um, Jenny Sorkin couldn't be with us today uh, to participate in, in the event, but we wanted to read a really short passage from her reflections on black noir. So I'll just, I'll try to in, impersonate her. <laughs> <laughs> or not really. One, noir is often used as a cinematic term a modifier that describes the somber tone and studied moodiness of a whodunit film. Whodunit is the perfect question to ask of a ceramic object. For most of history, pottery was unsigned, vernacular and functional. Then came the Industrial Revolution and sets of beautiful porcelain. Anna Suhoy dabbles in these traditions, mixing and matching histories to make self-consciously arty ceramic objects and installations, designing a faux product line called Black Noir, in which she produces ashtrays, paperweights, soap dishes, vases, an abstract tabletop, and freestanding sculptures in solid colored glazes. Two, in 668 AD, an assassin snuck into an imperial bathhouse in Sicily and brought a heavy soap dish crashing down on the head of Roman Emperor Constance II, who drowned. This was a quick and effective means of bringing about political change. Perhaps the soap dish is the prototype for all future vessels of outrage. Smashed vases, a pie in the face, red wine purposely dribbled on a bride. Suhoi's flesh-colored soap dish is the exact size and mass of a fist, loosely gripping a bar of soap. Surrounded by a sharp protrusion of knuckle, it is a fighter waiting to make a grand entrance. Three, ashtrays are paradoxical objects. Their most intimate companions are habits and pleasures, matchbooks and address books, coffee tables and coffee shops, booths and counters, bowling alleys, empty wine glasses, merriment, marriads, and unmentionables, nightstands and one night stands. Sturdy and silent, they betray nothing and judge no one, offering only to contain the remains of an evening. And there are several more numbers afterwards, so thank you. And uh, Rita, I'd like to pass it on to you. All right. Um, going to read from the work of others, but I wanted to start by saying um, thank you, Anna, for your pretzel logic. Um, thank you for your dirt. Thank you for your sweat. Thank you for your the porousness of your forms. Uh, thank you for your informality, and thanks for taking me in to your library, your PowerPoints, and your studio, and um, thanks for having a conversation, continual conversation with me. So I, uh, I just wanted to read a couple of excerpts. One is from the Book of Symbols, and it's the uh, description of the potter. Even today, the potter's art seems magically elemental. Is it the human hands kneading the earth, remembering themselves being shaped by nature? Is it the interaction between earth, water, air, and fire? Is it the sense that 
Just as fiery breath makes us physically and spiritually alive, so is there something living about the fired pot. The primeval forms and symmetries of the cosmos are its inspirations, linking us to an ancestrally revered mana-laden uh, Mana laden forces and animal and vegetative magic. In turn, the vessels of the potter's art have ever contained, secreted, and poured forth what is vital and sacred sacrificial blood and ritual offerings, ornamental flowers, seeds for sowing, harvest grains, fruits, herbs, and spices, food and feast, water for drinking and ablution. And then um, the other segment is from a book that I really love and go back to, it seems like every five years, but I, for some reason, thought about it this morning when I was thinking about this and found a couple of excerpts that I wanted to read in uh, relationship to Anna's work. So this is from um, a book called by Madeline Jins called um, Helen, Ke Kel Helen Keller or Arakawa. And this is from a section called The Gazing Other. I felt the hard, smooth sand so different from the loose, sharp sand, mingled with kelp and shells of the northern, northern American beaches I'd known as a child. I felt the pebbles rattling as the waves threw their ponderous weight against the shore. A heated beach always reminds me of the mood I lived in prior to teachers coming to me. Basically, in those days, I, in a brute fashion, went about satisfying my needs and having done with them. I took what was presented to me or grabbed for what was near, initiating no constructive moves on my own. I happened as a set of orifices. I demanded that things be given me or be put in, into me immediately upon my sensing a need for them. A dream from this period has condensed within it what for me was in those days the prevailing tense. A long string of bananas extended down from the ceiling in the dining room. All the bananas were peeled and deliciously ripe. Standing under these, I chomped away at them and proceeded to eat my way up the lengthy bunch. The dream shows the six-year-old dreamer not to be quite as undeveloped as some accounts have suggested she was. Here was someone with a sense of something as complex as a dining room. And this intensity that was a someone already knew the shape, feel, smell, and taste of banana. I was even able to conceive an, of an articulated out volume that would be a whole strain of these. Not only that, I could distinguish between a peeled banana and an unpeeled one, correctly recognizing the peeled one to be the edible version. I was capable, in the dream, of at least of inventing a form of constant feed. Or was this not an invention, but part memory and part imitation of bunches of bananas belonging to a banana tree I'd at some point been brought into contact with? Or had a bunch of bananas I'd found lying in the pantry been the model for this? Even though I had graduated to solid food years before this, I chose in the dream to be practically imbibing the plugs of soft solidity into me as though I were being fed from a bottle. Um, and then just real quick, um, from another section called Critical Beach. Oh, beach, what of compromise? This went on, or wrenching torque, or twister, or bit-grown core runner coordinate, or torsion of, or deformation, or contour, more particles, gravel, roar, lore, the ochre, vortexed, cortexed, oratund, orange grain of it, corrugated fortitude, corrugated anchoring, orb, sorsor, sorting pores, cornered odor, porridge, vigor. And this was heard as a compromising of what? Who is doing the compromising? Which envelope? Of which envelope did you speak? I fear the dreadful patina of compromise. Whatever's only half done or anything merely half noticed has this patina. How can I have nothing to do with this? I was then put through this. Micro orbs succored through abrasive strainers. Orbs numerous toward runner coordinate core non-torpor tenor or dormant forbidden oracular powder. 
gridded grid more corporeal, efforts micro operators, torsion orifices ignoring four million or four billion minor other orbs, vortices determining morphology of preformed neuter perforations, rotated orthogonal coral like corridors, brocade of porosity by arbor. I think I'll leave it at that. Again, thank you everybody who came. It's amazing to see all your faces and um, thank you to everyone who worked on this book. Um, I feel so lucky to have all you guys around me and to have your work here. It's, this is like, um, this, it's just like a beautiful dream, this <laughs> event and I'm just really happy, so thank you. And um, I'm just gonna read uh, a short piece of writing I um, wrote for my last show, which was in April, um, and I used it for the press release. Uh, it's right here, okay. Uh, the, the show was called Home Office. Deciding to live work is like jumping headfirst into the void. Will you get anything done at all or ever go out again? Long mornings are spent alone. You eat lunch at 10.30 or 2.45 or have two lunches or none at all. You sit on the bench, watch the clock and wait for an idea. You wait for your assistant to come wedge the clay as you check your phone. Does answering email in bed count as work? Familiar objects loom large as you pace the room. The whole world is compressed to the studio. Repeated images are the snarl of cords from the desktop to the power strip, your work clothes in a pile, the empty tissue box, your cluttered work table. This is your universe and you are a shuttle blasted into space processing from above. You caress your laptop with constant fingering and your fingers also leave prints in the clay. When you stare into space, is there thought? Images and information enter through your pupils. Where do they go after that? Often nowhere, but sometimes the information comes back after being digested and transformed. The orb sculptures are not large eyes, but models for rooms where you can take a break from all this. There's nothing Cartesian about them, thus the workday does not exist here. Life can be a beach if you let it. So, thank you. If I, I know we've been kind of elliptical, but if anybody has any questions um, for Anna or the contributors, um, we'd be happy to, to take them. Um, or about the process of the book, or... Or we can also just say it's Sunday and perhaps we just want to celebrate the publication and LA have L.A. Fog play. So play please help yourself to refreshments. Um, the book is also outside and L.A. Fog will be playing back there. So thank you so much for coming and thanks again to Anna. Thank you.